There's a passage in the canon where the Buddha has been wounded. Devadatta hurled a rock down the mountain, hoping to crush the Buddha. Instead, the rock ran against an obstacle and was shattered. One of the stone slivers penetrated the Buddha's foot. It was very painful. So he went to lie down. And as he was lying down, Mara came to taunt him. He said, are you moping here? Feeling depressed. The Buddha said, no, I'm spreading goodwill to all beings. It's an interesting strategy. Instead of focusing on his own pain, these are all beings being happy. And it's a useful strategy to adopt in lots of different situations where your pain is pretty heavy and it's weighing you down. Try to get out of yourself. Think about other beings. Remember the pattern on the Buddha's night of awakening. When he got his mind into concentration, he directed it to remembering past lives, and he found he could remember many, many, many past lives. In other words, his narratives. You think you've got lots of narratives as you sit down to meditate. He had more than, more than many because his memory was so good. But it raised a question. Was he the only one who had all these many past lives? And what was the pattern? Because you just look at lives and they just go one after another after another, and at the outset it doesn't seem to have that much of a pattern. You can do good in this lifetime and suffer in the next, and then have pleasure in a much later lifetime. So the question was, is there a pattern? To see the pattern, you have to think about all beings. Dying and passing away. Everybody looking for happiness, but creating a lot of trouble through their own actions. Sometimes finding happiness and sometimes not. And it was based on their actions. If their actions were based on right view, done with skillful intentions, then they were going to benefit from those actions. If they were based on wrong view and unskillful intentions, they were going to suffer. And from that much larger perspective, then he was able to turn and look back on his own suffering in the present moment. Looking for the intention, looking for the view. And what kind of intention and what kind of view, instead of leading to good or bad rebirths, would actually lead you out of the cycle. And he found that there were intentions and there were views that could do that. Right view, right concentration, right resolve. All these work together to get you out. That was how he was able to gain escape from his suffering. Notice the pattern. You get perspective on your own suffering first by thinking about the suffering and happiness of others. And think about how they all want happiness. This is one of the reasons why we spread thoughts of goodwill to everybody every night, every morning, to take us out of our immediate perspective and to take on a larger perspective. Then we can turn around and look back at our own sufferings and have a new way of looking at them, realizing it's not just us. Everybody's suffering. Everybody wants happiness. And that takes some of the weight off of our own suffering. It also makes it easier to live with other people, realizing that they're bungling along as well. It makes them less, a lot less fearful. Because when you understand others, you can deal with them with a lot less fear. It's through lack of understanding other people that they're very scary. We have anxiety about dealing with other people who will be judging us. All kinds of anxieties, 
social anxieties and anxieties at work. And if we focus too much on our own anxieties, we make the situation worse. It's good to get out of ourselves for a bit and think about, well, what do they want? And why are they acting the way they act? The basic underlying assumption has to be they're acting for the sake of happiness. Well, what's their conception of happiness? If their conception is something that you help provide for and be following the precepts at the same time, then you have, we have a way of dealing with them and negotiating with them, coming not out of fear but more out of understanding. It's like dealing with snakes. When you don't understand snakes at all, they're very scary. We had some here, someone here last week who was thinking that snakes went around wanting to bite people. So, of course, every time he saw a snake, he was scared. But you realize the snakes don't want to bite people. That's the last thing they want to do. They'll do it if they have to, but that's not what they're looking for. It makes it a lot easier to deal with them. The same with other people. Think about the fact they want happiness. Then we have some screwy ideas about what it's going to be. But maybe there's something in there that you can help provide for. And that gives you leverage, so they're not totally scary. And you begin to get a sense of what they're, where they're coming from and what you can anticipate. The past several months I've been practicing my French by reading up biographies. And two people in particular were interesting. This Talleyrand, in English we call him Talleyrand, the French call him Talleyrand, and Mazarin. And both of them were in very precarious situations. They had a lot of power. They were, in many cases, the power behind the throne. But the throne could turn around and stomp on them any time at all. So they had to be very careful. And being in a position like they had, there were lots of people who wanted, they were out to get them. And on the one hand, they were both very bold people. They had a lot of physical courage. But they were also very, very cautious. And in both cases, they were very careful about thinking about what do other people want. And as they were trying to advance their own careers, they were thinking about, well, what could I do to help other people? And this is why they were not so afraid of other people. They figured out what do they want, what can I provide? Now, in some of their cases, it wasn't all that skillful in the Buddha sense. It's going to be, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. But both of them were really marked by the fact that they had nerves of steel. They were thrown in difficult situations where everybody else thought, well, that's the end, and they were able to find some way out. Because they tried to get out of their own fears and think about the other side. Well, the other people who were against them, what, would, what did they want? Maybe we can find a solution. Oh, as Talleyrand said, when you're negotiating with someone else and you're actually getting the better of the other person, make sure they don't lose face. Keep the other person's feelings in mind, and it's a lot easier to deal with them. So when you find yourself suffering from anxiety about dealing with other people, try to get out of your anxiety. Think about what, what do they want. Think a bit about their happiness and the fact that they're suffering. And that only, not only gives you a perspective on your own sufferings, but also makes it a lot easier to deal with other people because you're coming less from fear and more from you using your powers of observation. And spreading thoughts of goodwill is one way of doing this. You think about, may these other people be happy? And you realize, okay, they are looking for happiness. We're all coming from a place where we're suffering. And that realization helps to equalize things or levels of playing field to some extent. And then when the time comes to turn around and look at your own sufferings, you've got a new perspective on them. You realize that you're not the only one suffering. And there's something you can learn from the lessons that other people have learned in their quest to overcome suffering as well. This is why we're here practicing. 
as someone once said, this is one of the most reassuring things about Buddhism, is it talks very openly about suffering. It doesn't hide it, doesn't push it away. Like the doctor who's willing to say, okay, the operation will have a chance for success, but there's a chance that it won't succeed. And they talk about very openly about what happens if it doesn't succeed, so you have a way of making a decision. Rather than the person who just says, well, 90% chance of success, so you, there's a, no way that it can fail. Well, you say, wait a minute, what about that other 10%? The people who try to hide the 10%, those are the ones you have to watch out for. But the Buddha talks openly about suffering because he does have a cure. So we can learn from his lessons. And he, what did he learn from? He learned from his own experience, but he also learned from watching the experience of others, the behavior of others. So we're not here just gazing at our navels. We're learning to be more observant all around, watching the mind directly as we're meditating, and then watching other people as we deal with them. It helps if you have a sense of a position of strength inside as you're watching others, so you don't feel quite so threatened. But it's the observation that allows you to understand where other people are coming from, and you're not dealing with the fear of the unknown. This is one of the reasons why when the Buddha talks about mindfulness, there's mindfulness internally and there's mindfulness externally. In other words, you notice that you're suffering in a particular way. We realize, okay, other people are suffering in that way too. That realization helps to equalize things, makes the suffering a little bit easier to bear. It's not like the universe has picked you out for special torment. And you realize that the torment doesn't come from the universe anyhow, it comes from your own actions. You see other people making themselves miserable, you turn it up, well, then you realize I'm doing the same sort of thing. So it not only equalizes things, but it helps give you some clues about what is the way out. So sometimes it is useful to reflect on the happiness and suffering of others. So your dealings with them are a lot easier, and your dealings with yourself get more effective.